I mean, I guess people always like to talk about the thyroid a little bit for sure. I mean, that'll, that can take up a lot. That can yeah. be a in and of itself. You know, they've always got those questions. We're live, Keith. Yeah. We're live. So um, welcome, everyone, uh, to this new episode of the TOT Doctors Roundtable. If you haven't already, please subscribe by hitting the red button and the notification bell so you won't miss anything. So first thing, I heard the rumor that the TOT Doctors Roundtable is dead. Of course, that is false. The roundtable is alive and kicking and even better than ever. So today, again, we will prove it to you. And on our panel this evening, as you can see, it's just Dr. Keith Nichols for the moment. Welcome, uh, Dr. Keith. Hey, Steve. Good to see you again, buddy. Hi. Sadly enough, Dr. Eric Serrano couldn't make it last minute, but he promised to be on one of the next uh, roundtables together with Keith real soon. So don't you worry. We'll keep the questions that were um, especially for him for the next time. Okay, so I see already a lot of people in the chat box. Hi, Danny Bossa, you're always there. Welcome. And a lot of other guys, uh, always the same names uh, coming back. I appreciate it. And a lot of you people as well. So welcome to the stream. So, Keith, maybe uh, first question that we already prepared a bit and that we went over um, before. Um, is there a need to measure estrogen and DHT? And if not for medical reasons, as discussed before, since we won't be blocking it or doing anything about it anyway, but maybe because of uh, legal reasons, as Dr. Rob suggested in the previous roundtable. This, this is Scott Howell. Hey, Scott. Anyway, oh. you can join on this Zoom. Dr. Scott was maybe coming on as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, like, yeah, you'd, you'd be a big help anyway, especially with the good supplements. But if he, he sent you an invite, but, but pop in, you'll be a big help because uh, Eric could make it. So it's kind of, it'll be off the cuff, whatever Stephen wants to talk about and the questions are, but uh, you're brilliant. Okay. Yeah, we started. Yeah, he's live. So we're live. So if you can, if you can zoom in, zoom in with us. All right, buddy. Yeah, pull, pull on in, pull on in. Okay, all right, see you in three or four minutes. All right, hopefully I have Dr. Howell in about three to four minutes. Sorry about that interruption, guys, but we, we, want, we want Dr. Howell. Uh, he's a brilliant man, so we'll definitely Great. get that. I have to cut the phone off so we don't get any more interruptions. All right, uh, measuring uh, DHT, let's go back into that. Uh, uh, of course, that subject came up uh, uh, recently, and... Uh, so uh, I've been through every guideline, uh, the Canadian guidelines, uh, British guidelines, all the American guidelines, the American Urology Association, the Endocrine Society, every guideline on the treatment of hypogonadism with testosterone, and none of those guidelines do they mention ever measuring DHT. So we should be able to put that to rest as far as DHT goes. We provided some the evidence there that the uh, mechanism for DHT uh, in the intraprostatic region is tightly controlled. So uh, even in extremely high serum levels, 10 times physiologic, you know, normal range that the serum levels remain consistent there within the prostate. So it hasn't been proven to cause prostate hypertrophy or cancer. And so we can kind of stop worrying about this. Uh, I don't think all these societies would get all that wrong. Uh, and even with regard to the treatment of prostate cancer, I can't find any treatment guidelines with regard to prostate cancer where they are also measuring or blocking DHT. Okay, and what for medical uh, purposes maybe, just to be safe if there was ever something of a board uh, asking you about uh, those levels? It's absolutely no guideline at all. And even in the guidelines, we're well aware because we have decades of utilizing testosterone now, over 70 years, 80 years, and we've been using it transdermally. And we know using it transdermally will raise DHT levels over injections, but we have not been able to show there has been any harm with doing so to date. Maybe in the future that will happen, 
But in the last 70 to 80 years with people using, and I'll continue to use the word abusing testosterone as well, uh, and raising DHT by doing so, we have not seen any harm. Okay. And, and it is over the counter in some countries. Exactly. So it's got a bad reputation or had one, but uh, to date, we can't show you any literature that it has caused harm when raised by giving testosterone. Okay. Thank you. That's clear. Then another question that was prepared, um, prepared before or scheduled. Uh, someone asked us uh, on the group, I am seeing more and more men for hormone optimization nowadays. And in most cases, uh, I start by optimizing their testosterone, next thyroid. And in most cases, I advise taking vitamin D and melatonin as well. But two questions about that. What supplements should you generally recommend with that? Omega-3 fatty acids, magnesium, any others? What's your normal take on that, Keith, well, when you start? Well, I do, and I think my patients will attest to this. I'm, I, I'm, you know, I, they're free to take any supplements that they, they see fit or, or they read about and they want. Uh, I, I will say this, uh, and, and the job is still hard because look at all the miscommunication and misinformation that's out there just with hormones alone. Uh, I try to tell everyone that, what I try to do with my hormones, my job to them is to build a strong foundation. If you're going to build a house, you can build a spec home, you can build a custom home, but you want to build whatever you do on an extremely strong, solid foundation and your hormones are that foundation. So my initial focus with all my patients are to get those hormones in an optimal range. And uh, I, I'll tell the patients and they'll, they'll vouch for this, that those are the bullets. Uh, supplements are great. They can be very helpful, but they're BBs compared to the bullets of hormones. So I initially focused on hormones. And then of course, when that happens, people start seeing results when they actually diet and exercise. Uh, before that, they kind of give up, they come in, they, they've gained weight, they don't feel like working out. But once you can get them, you know, uh, into a better lifestyle, then we can start talking supplements. But yes, do I feel that we should be taking free fatty acids? Sure. If you have, if you want to raise your HDL, should you take niacin? Sure. Red yeast rice? Absolutely. Uh, do I take curcumin? Yes, I do. Uh, you know, I do think your antioxidant, antioxidants, your, your, you know, your A, E, and D. Yes, of course, vitamin D, very important. So, so yes, I'm a, I'm a believer in supplements. Uh, but uh, I, I optimize hormones first and foremost for my patients. That, that's, that's my, that is my main focus. And let me tell you, that is hard enough. That is hard enough. If they're looking for supplements to make them feel better, it's not going to happen. It's got to be the hormones first, and then we can really get into the finer details of the supplements. Okay, sure. And second part of that question, when uh, should I add in pregnenolone and DHA into that mix? Uh, do you do that immediately when you start optimizing thyroid and testosterone? Or do you wait for certain symptoms uh, to appear before adding those? Okay, well, well as we talk, uh, here comes Scott. Good. Uh, you know, I, I, I really want to focus on a preventative medicine program. And I've talked about this before. Yes, there are two feel-good hormones. They are thyroid and they are testosterone. You, uh, if you're deficient in those, you feel it, you feel terrible, you replace those to an optimal level, you'll have improvement, you will feel better. Um, but each individual hormone has its own individual beneficial effects. And so why would I just want to stop with testosterone and thyroid? I want the beneficial effects of DHEA. DHEA. I mean, let's think about it. Uh, as we age, all our hormones decline. That includes DHEA and pregnenolone and melatonin. We, we don't produce as much as you did when you were younger. And the whole object of preventative medicine is to bring those hormone levels up to the upper range of normal for a young, healthy person. So DHEA, you know, uh, reduces cardiovascular risk by increasing lipolysis. So it decreases visceral body fat, which is responsible for 13 different cancers at least. Uh, it stimulates the immune system, uh, it restores sexual vitality, it improves mood, decreases cholesterol, uh, total body fat as well, it improves memory, increases energy level, uh, has anti-cancer properties by enhancing the immune system, it works as an antidepressant. Uh, you know, I'm not so sure 
why I don't want to optimize all those beneficial effects in my individual patients. Okay, that's clear. Welcome, Scott. Hey. Huh? Hi. Hey, to the party. I was late. Okay, no problem. Dr. Eric Serrano couldn't make it last minute, but you made it at least. Thanks a lot for that. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, so let's go to the next question. Uh, I read uh, the questions from the chat box uh, at the end of this uh, episode. So another question that kept on coming back in the Facebook group as well as under several videos. You already uh, read it as well, uh, Keith. Um, if you feel better on TRT than ever before, when and how to tinker with dosage, timing and other things to see if you could feel even better then? So that's a bit of a question. How do you know you feel your best before you tinker with it uh, to feel even better, maybe? So what's your take on that, Keith? So, uh, so Scott, the question is, if you start TRT and you feel better, you feel good, should you take more to see if you feel even better? So uh, uh, I want to hear Scott on this. Okay. Well, in, in my opinion, if you're feeling good, there's no reason to go any further. If you, um, if you, if you, if your uh, sense of well-being and your overall sense of health has improved and you feel good, sometimes, um, in my opinion, uh, you don't have to change anything. You need to keep going with the template that works. Now, if you start having decreases and you start feeling uh, fatigued, um, any uh, symptomatic in any way, then obviously you would address that. But as far as just um, and increasing just to increase. If you feel good, then I think that's a pretty good place to start. I think that is a, a brilliant answer from a brilliant man because that would be the answer I would give. And as I talked to you, Stephen, uh, yesterday very briefly, I fear that uh, we may be getting away from where I want to stay and where we all began. And that was with medical testosterone replacement therapy. It was for men with significant symptoms of hypogonadism. Now, when you give those men testosterone back that have significant symptoms, you, as Scott said, you improve their well-being. You give them their life back. You know, they're able to be with their family, to enjoy their family, to have a sexual relationship with their wife, uh, their better em uh, employees. So uh, I'm, I'm afraid, though, that it's turning into uh, more and more younger men starting testosterone because they never want to feel tired if they're starting to see that they're just not making the gains in the gym that they that they used to that i should you know get on trt you know uh i don't have an erection every day i can't cut diamonds with my erections anymore you know uh, those guys typically aren't always super pleased when they start trt so uh so really i want to keep it within the medical realm and that's where that's where we need to stay so if you are significantly symptomatic, as I have been, and you start testosterone, it is life-changing. If you're not, it's not life-changing. And so uh, if you feel better, then, uh, then getting more is not going to there, – there's, there's a point of diminishing return. You're not going to feel any better if you have resolved or significantly improved those symptoms for which you started. Yeah, dose response work, works both ways. I mean, you get to a certain point where – optimization uh, starts to uh, burn in to the ground and you go past that and that's where most side effects and harmful effects uh, uh, come from. Not uh, uh, per se to uh, HRT within medical le levels like uh, Keith is talking about, but you have guys that have mixed goals and, and mixed, um, how do I want to say this? They come in with goals that are outside of medical HRT. Correct. And when that conflicts, you're always going to have people that aren't happy or, or this and that. And it goes right back to um, they're using it for a different reason. Look, okay. no matter how optimal you are, there are going to be weeks where you're down, depressed, where you don't have a, you know, an erection every morning. You don't have you know, as much energy, you're tired, you're working hard. It, you, it, optimization is not feeling and functioning your best 10 out of 10, 365 days a year. It just, 
that's not the way us humans work. We we have our our ups and downs. We have our moments. Yeah. And, Okay, I just uh, see one interesting question passing in the chat box uh, coming back on the previous point. Uh, John Perry asks, should I supplement testosterone if my testosterone is low, but my DHT is substantially above the DHT reference range? I guess that's all about uh, what symptoms uh, the man has, isn't it, uh, Keith? Well, once again, we're not focusing on numbers. This is a, That was a number question. Uh, uh, why are you measuring your DHT? Uh, number one, okay, uh, if you're having symptoms of hypergonadism, which are, we've been over these a hundred times, everybody knows what they are, uh, then the only way to improve those symptoms is to raise your, your testosterone levels. Okay, I think that's a very clear answer. Anything to add, Scott? Well, I just think if uh, you're making a comment about a low testosterone level, how did you come to conclude that the testosterone level was low in the first place and the same with the DHT being high. Um, so it depends on the person's reference. And if they have an incorrect reference, like most people do, then um, there's, there's, there's just too, too much in that question. It's, it's too loaded, too many, too many avenues to go down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Something we talked about in our private session yesterday, Keith, maybe I want to ask again. Um, how can you be so sure that our 20% uh, transcrotal testosterone cream, a lot of guys are using uh, now, uh, will be safe long term? And are there any studies done on that? Maybe repeat what you told me yesterday. That was very reassuring. Right. <laughs> right. And then Scott will probably be able to answer this better than, than most. But Scott, are there any long-term studies even using injectable testosterone, a therapeutic dose, meaning 200 or more, you know, or so of testosterone sipionate per week for 10 years, treating symptoms, actually treating symptoms? I, I don't know. Uh, as far as there, there have been long-term studies, but there's been no no studies that I know of that have went that far with symptoms. Um, what exactly. So, so the doses that they use are most the studies low in short term. They're 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 low dose short term studies. You know. So with regard to when we apply to the uh, to scrotum, we are adjusting the dosage. We're titrating dosage to a response. That response is improvement of symptoms. So it's no different than adjusting your injection dose. We're gonna adjust that injection dose to increase, to improve your symptoms. Uh, your symptoms are typically gonna improve as we increase your free testosterone level. We're doing nothing any different by applying it to the scrotum. Now that question came out because a doctor recently said, well, the study they only used 12.5, 25, and 50 milligrams to the scrotum, and you're using two and three times that. That study was not a study on men looking at symptomatology or treatment with testosterone. They were purely looking at the pharmacokinetics of testosterone applied that way. They wanted to see when the peak occurred. They wanted to see when the peak of DHT occurred, they actually measured their estrogen. So it was purely on pharmacokinetics. It wasn't on men and treating symptoms. Now, if we were going to do a study and treat men with symptoms, I doubt that 12.5 milligrams applied to the scrotum was going to help, just like 2% uh, androgel is not going to help very many men either. Nor will a 50 milligram dose of testosterone cypionate once every two weeks. Doubt that's going to help either. So you know, we hope to do the studies. Uh, that's what Scott and I plan on doing is taking the patient population that we have and that we'll be getting and actually util utilizing that database for long gene efficacy of treating symptoms, utilizing transcranial testosterone. I think what a lot but of they have been, they have been using transcranial testosterone for decades now with no, with no harm, with no harm. I think what a lot of people get confused about is they don't they don't understand that any study 
has to be, the outcomes have to be included in the design. So if something like what Keith was talking about, the pharmacokinetics of testosterone, I mean, if we're designing symptom resolution, we have to, the, the study has to be, ha have that in the design factor. And if you're trying to interpret studies for one outcome that wasn't designed for, then uh, there's no conclusions that can be drawn. So uh, that's my two cents in there. <laughs> okay. So let's pass on to the next All question. All testosterone to the scrotum does is it raises your levels very, very, very good. And they, 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 the levels come up very nicely. Uh, yes, your DHT rises as well as do all transdermal forms. Uh, but your serum levels are no different necessarily with a, an injectable form of testosterone if used at the, a similar dosage. Now, there is no, there is no dosage calculator from transcrotal to injections. There is no conversion factor, believe me. Uh, well, I've, I've, I've looked over and over again. Men can come in on extremely high doses of uh, testosterone injections, and it only takes a minimal amount applied to the scrotum, and they get just as good, if not better, levels. So, so there is no conversion uh, with regard to going from a transcrotal to an injection or vice versa, and they both work. Uh, people tend to think that Dr. Nichols is all about transcrotal. That's the method that I use, yes. Uh, that's the method that a lot of my patients come to, to utilize, yes. But do I also prescribe injections? Well, of course. I use injections mm -hmm. or transcrotal application. It, it's, it's patient choice. It's very fast. I mean, if it has to be titrated up, it can be titrated up quicker um, than having to wait a week or longer for an injection and then waiting for uh, the uh, plasma levels to rise from that. So yeah, it's a, it's a very effective method, very quick. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, you mind sharing your, uh, now, uh, Stephen, you, you, you switched over, I switched over. Scott's a long-term, you know, knows more about testosterone than probably all of us. Uh, and how's your switch then? Oh, uh, well, actually, um, as far as libido, uh, it was noticeable within uh, the second day. The second day that uh, I applied in morning and evening, and then the next morning and evening, um, I was thinking about sex. I mean, I was, I was thinking my libido was higher. Um, uh, and it has been consistently. I wake up with more morning erections. Um, and you know, my sleep has been better too. My sleep has been more solid. And I, there's a lot of symptoms that improved very, very quickly. I even sent uh, Keith a text. I'm like, wow, this, I mean, this was very, very fast. And I remember using Androgel a long time ago um, and just thinking it was just complete crap. But after doing this cream, I mean, it's very, you have to get in the mode of applying it every morning and every evening. Uh, but other than that, I, I enjoy it. It's very helpful for me. Okay, great. And one question I had on those morning uh, erections. Uh, I always believed that uh, men had morning erections because the level of testosterone was highest in the morning. But once you're on TRT, your normal uh, circadian rhythm disappears. So uh, how does do these uh, morning erections still come uh, on that moment? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Are you, are you talking about like the uh, biochemistry of it or... Or, yeah, or, why, why, why that exact moment? Since uh, when you're applying twice a day testosterone cream to the scrotum, the level is very uh, stable uh, whole day through. You know, I, I, uh, I really don't have anything on the top of my mind except uh, uh, that the uh, levels are, are faster uh, and any conversion that converts even to DHT is quicker. Um, so I, I'm not, I would have to go back through and look and, and find actual mechanisms, but um, possibly Keith, do you have anything to add there? I wish I wish I knew the answer to that one too. I'm just glad that it happens. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I can I can dig and, and find what the what it is, but um, it's very quick. I mean, I was amazed. I I I, I didn't think it was going to happen that fast. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another question I already had noted uh, a while ago. Is there a big difference in the scrotal application of testosterone versus injections when it comes to elevating hematocrites? Well, I mean, I, that answer, I mean, I know Scott knows the literature on that very well, and I've got tons of it right in front of me. But 
injections increase hematocrit mm -hmm. over transdermal forms. Yes, yeah. hematocrit is increased with injections more so with any within the transdermal forms. And I think some of that has to do with the um, when the depots metabolize from inside of the muscle, the rate is more consistent and the uh, hepcidin is suppressed to a greater degree. And then there's direct uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cell stimulation. So those myeloid cell lines are more stimulated because the stimulation is constant. Uh, whereas with the transcrotal, you have a peak and then it, it goes back down quicker uh, it, in, in comparison to the long-term kinetics of testosterone with a longer ester, it's going to be uh, uh, the, the peak and trope levels are different. So uh, there's higher stimulation of those myeloid uh, cell lines. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. I think that covers it. So I have one more question that was prepared before we go to the Q&A from the chat box. So um, thyroid optimization. Are there certain levels of T3, T4 and or TSH to aim for? And is that optimal range also higher than the normal laboratory values as uh, is the case for testosterone levels? So uh, Keith or Scott, who wants to take that one first? I think you can hit this one really good, Keith. Okay. Well, we let's. I mean, thyroid is a is a touchy, touchy, touchy subject. It gets uh, uh, it gets more physicians in trouble with other physicians than 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 even testosterone. So uh, we can we can try to tiptoe around this as much as we can. But 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 the testosterone, like testosterone, the thyroid normative range is based on the average of the population of sick people. I mean, those people that are tested for their thyroid are not people that are completely asymptomatic. They're not screened for symptoms of subclinical hypothyroidism or hypothyroidism. So we've got this, this normative range that is not the healthiest uh, of, of, our, of our species. But as we know, uh, thyroid controls temperature, metabolism, cerebral function and energy. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it protects against cardiovascular disease and improves cognition. It uh, decreases fatigue, it, it improves against memory loss, it decreases visceral body fat. So it does all these great things. Uh, and uh, so do I feel that uh, as part of a preventative medicine program, I mean, I once again want, want all those positive effects in a patient. Uh, what we run into right now is just having to be extremely careful because of what our colleagues I will say because they associate exogenous us giving you thyroid supplementation with what happens when a person has true hyperthyroidism or Graves disease, but Graves disease is, has an autoimmune component. So, uh, so they're afraid that they're going to become osteoporotic. Or you're going to have some cardiovascular events when you're given uh, thyroid, which will suppress your TSH. And so they feel there's danger in a suppressed TSH, but yet we suppress TSH in people with thyroid nodules that have thyroid cancer and, and, and they're not dying of uh, cardiac events or becoming osteoporotic. Uh, so typically they measure just TSH and a T4. So in classical hypothyroidism, you're gonna have decreased production of thyroid. So therefore you'll have an increased TSH and you'll have decreased T4, T3. But what we run into more cases of is secondary or tertiary hypothyroidism. Secondary is where you have a normal TSH and a normal T4, but a low T3. Now T3 is what is active at the cellular level. That's what provides us with all the benefits of thyroid. Um, but if you don't measure T3, you won't see it. So you're gonna miss it. So traditionally we're only taught to measure TSH and T4. Now, tertiary hypothyroidism kind of fits into the research that we wanna do with the EDCs and the antigen receptors. Uh, tertiary hypothyroidism is when you're gonna have a normal TSH or normal T4 and a normal T3, but yet you still have the symptoms of hypothyroidism. Now that's where you're dealing with receptor site resistance. And the only way to make those people feel better is to give them a trial of thyroid. 
So with men, I typically like to optimize their testosterone, get them in an optimal range. Uh, if they're still uh, complaining of a significant degree of fatigue, then I would then I will uh, then address their thyroid. A thyroid can also improve sexual dysfunction in men. Um, so, uh, but with women, it's they're much more sensitive to it. They're much more complicated than we are. You know, you have to deal with estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. I mean, uh, and uh, thyroid. The thyroid plays a role in ovulation with them. So, thyroid is extremely important in women. So, it's something that you obviously look up right up front. But with men, I tend to uh, try to optimize all the other hormones first, and then and then go after thyroid, mm -hmm. if needed. If needed. Okay. You uh, agree with that, Scott? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Keith's right on. Uh, there's a lot of factors with um, uh, someone's uh, uh, thyroid health state, uh, whether the um, uh, thyroid is function uh, in the correct manner. But uh, there's so much that I, I see a lot of people, um, uh, you know, they post their lab values and stuff in some forms. And, you know, they're looking at TSH and uh, T4. And, you know, in my opinion, you could probably just test for T3 by itself to determine um, a majority of what the health function of their thyroid is. But there's, I mean, people can have enzyme uh, issues where they convert uh, T3 to reverse T3 and it's non-functioning. Um, you can have um, uh, enzyme problems where uh, T4 is not converted to T3 in the um in a sufficient manner so uh the stuff that it keeps mentioned it, it's right on point you if that needs to be addressed it it should be addressed mm -hmm. okay couldn't agree more so then over to the q a from the chat box that i already gathered a bit so someone asked um with TRT, the main focus on forums and social media is always on testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, and DHEA. But uh, the man asks, uh, since the hormone chain starts with pregnenolone right after uh, cholesterol, Roar, uh, oddly enough, uh, he doesn't see that being discussed uh, a lot. So what are the doc's insights on how to tackle low uh, pregnenolone levels? And what about optimizing this hormone? What can achieve it in correlation to optimal testosterone levels and what effect does it have on uh, DHEA, for example? So um, that's a bit of a, a long question, but uh, what about optimizing pregnant alone as a start uh, for the optimization process? What do you think about that, Scott? Uh, actually, this is one of the areas that, uh, you know, I'm not really strong on that. I just, uh, Keith brought me up to speed recently on this uh, with the pregnant alone. Um, okay. If I'm not mistaken, um, uh, pregnant alone, um, um, there was, what, what else are you including there, Keith? With pregnant alone? Yes. Well, I, well, besides what, what do we opt for besides pregnant alone yeah. initially? Mm -hmm. or with, well, testosterone, thyroid, DHEA, uh, melatonin yeah. for sure, vitamin D, pregnant alone, uh, all those for sure. Uh, I, I will, what I will do uh, after this podcast is I will forward a, a nice paper on pregnenolone that should explain in detail the answer to that question. It's, it's very involved. It is scientific, but it will give you a lot of what's going on with regard to pregnenolone. Uh, you know, it's used, uh, it, it's, it, 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 it's, it's involved in neural protection. Uh, it's involved in, uh, it's an anxiolytic, meaning it reduces anxiety. It's used to treat depression, schizophrenia. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it helps in addiction processes. Uh, it has a great impact on uh, cannabinoid-related dysfunction. It, uh, you know, uh, low levels are associated with psychiatric disorders and pregnant and supplementation uh, is associated with improvement of those disorders. So it has a lot of uh, beneficial effects of that you know, there's a lot of animal studies on it. There are some human studies with it. And so what I'll do is include this paper because we could spend an entire hour just with this paper. And it's probably something we should do one day is, is, is go through the paper like Dr. Rizier did. But this paper here will certainly uh, give you all the inside information that you'll want to know when it comes to neurosteroids, which 
pregnenolone is a neurosteroid and all the beneficial effects and what they're seeing with regard to the ongoing studies and what they're studying it for, okay? So pregnenolone for me is an important one. I, I use it, uh, I supplement it in all my patients as well. It seems to be very well tolerated or it is very well tolerated. Okay, when I get that uh, forwarded uh, paper from you, Keith, I will post it on the, or you can do it as well, on the closed Facebook group uh, we have. Then the other question was um, DHEA versus Key to 7 DHEA. I have no idea, Keith. Is there anything to that? Uh, that's uh, uh, 7 DHEA, it's just a metabolite of DHEA that's not converted to any other androgens. So uh, there have been some uh, studies with it uh, where it will maintain uh, resting metabolic rate or basal metabolic rate on people that are on low calor caloric diets. Uh, there's some questions to some of those studies because they, it wasn't used in isolation, it was used with other substances. Uh, but what they're wanting to use it for is to uh, assist with uh, the reduction in body fat, of course. So that's what the 7T uh, keto DHEA is being used for, is to, uh, whenever someone wants to diet, it's a supplement, it's sold over the counter as a supplement, but although it is banned, uh, it's a banned supplement, you can't use it as far as, you know, if you're tested as an athlete, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's used to maintain your metabolic rate when you go on a diet, because you know, when you go on a calorie restricted diet, your metabolic rate slows down and, you know, of course the weight loss becomes harder. So, so that's what it's used for. Okay. Any experience with it, Scott? No. Okay. Me neither. Never heard of it in Belgium. <laughs> Never seen it. Okay. Uh, Danny Bossa, our good friend, asked, can you elaborate on hormone optimization for women who ha have just given birth? If they take progesterone, won't they stop lactating? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. It'll certainly help with postpartum depression. It's certainly. Okay, so I think this is the point where we should um, maybe say um, very soon on the YouTube channel, we'll have uh, some uh, more YouTube uh, videos on uh, female hormone optimization sure. by uh, an expert on the topic, isn't it, Keith? <laughs> yes. Okay, so you, you will see that uh, happening, guys. The next question, does anyone have experience or knowledge of research in the area of TRT helping people that have multiple sclerosis? Maybe you have, uh, Scott. You know, um, I just went through, through some studies here recently. Um, give me one second. Let me see if I can uh, pull something up. We're going to be, uh, I'm going to have the all the information for the androgen receptor upregulation up deal soon. So that's going to be something that we're going to cover. Okay. In the meanwhile, I had um, what I think is a kind of a funny question. question. Is it okay to drink socially in the weekends while taking metformin or should I avoid alcohol altogether while on medication? <laughs> well, that's pretty easy. <laughs> um, I think so. Yeah, you need to. I, I think everyone should stay away um, from drinking alcohol. I mean, uh, one of my uh, pathology um, professors a long time ago, uh, he was talking about uh, alcohol, and we went through all the pathways where um, uh, a metabolite of formaldehyde is made in the in the liver and all that. And um, one of the th interesting things about seeing all these uh, autopsies of, of livers where people had, had drank over time is that the damage happens very quickly. And in most situations, there's not a real, you know, how can I say this? I do not see the value of, uh, drinking alcohol for anybody that's focused on their health because it is a poison. It does cause dose dependent effects um, and it wrecks the metabolism. I know Keith, uh, you probably have more to this, but you can, you, a person could drink occasionally, but I, you know, I just don't really see the merit and 
What do you think, Keith? I hope I, I'll, I'll agree with you there, but uh, uh, but you know uh, I'll, I'll also admit that I'm I'm a social drinker here and there. You know, with football season comes along, I've made no when George Bulldogs are playing. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm right there with some. Uh, you know, uh, my, my wife certainly will drink a margarita here and there. You know what that does. So I'm not gonna you know you know keep her from having one of those. Like I said. It, Makes her clothes fall off. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Really? Well, I haven't anything uh, to add to that. Uh, I'm not a drinker at all. I had uh, five glasses of alcohol in my entire life, and that was in the first half of my life. So I just don't like it, and uh, I won't have any more. So I can't uh, add anything to that or understand why people want to drink that anyway, especially if you worry about your hormones. I don't think you should uh, exaggerate on that. Well, one of the biggest, I think, distinctions that you have to make is between drinking socially, like Keith mentioned, and binge drinking on a weekend. Yeah. Yes. Now, binge drinking on a weekend or uh, getting out with buddies and getting loaded and um, uh, get, going to the bars and stuff, that is terrible. It is, I mean, I can't say enough about how bad binge drinking is on your health and uh, your uh, the allostatic load of your liver. I mean, it's just terrible. Uh, um, the, the dose makes the poison. So, I mean, if you're drinking a lot, a long time, there's going to be some type of effect. Okay, I completely agree. Hey, Stephen, back to your previous question, because I'm sitting there looking at it. I just sent it to you on your question about the multiple sclerosis, which is mm -hmm. a demyelinating disorder. Uh, in the pregnenolone paper that I just sent you, there's a section on neuroprotection related functions. Now important pregnenolone is for myelin, so remyelination. So uh, it's section 2.23. So whoever asked that question, if you will uh, look at this study, section 2.23 on pregnenolone. Pregnenolone uh, may be something uh, that may be certainly beneficial uh, for someone with multiple sclerosis. Okay, thank you so much. Then a question that was touched on by Deep Freeze and then Ibosa already reposted that question. So we should really take it. So the question, I read it, uh, estrogen symptoms, low body fats, daily injections, 100 milligrams per week. Is it best to lower test even more or have high testosterone but use an AI? So do you understand what uh, has been asked, Keith? Let's break that down a little bit yeah. better. Yeah. So I guess the man has estrogen symptoms with the low body fat and daily injections in total 100 milligrams per week, but it's not too much. And he asks, because of this, does he still have to lower the testosterone even more or should he just use an AI for these estrogen uh, symptoms? What are, uh, how did he establish he has estrogen symptoms? That's my question too. Go ahead. That, oh, okay, I mean, so I mean, may, yeah, maybe Deep Freeze, who asked the question, add your symptoms in the chat box so we can uh, come back to that one. Someone asked, can you touch on the importance of SHBG? Why only 1% of T is free and why you don't want to lower SHBG? Scott, you must know all about SHBG for sure. What was the question again? I was getting ready to type something in the window. Okay, just uh, on the importance of SHBG. So we, we, we should touch on the importance of it, why only 1% of uh, T is free and why you don't want to lower your SHBG. Well, this, uh, this, gets it, uh, this opens up uh, uh, some complicated discussions. Number one, if you're going by the free hormone hypothesis, you're going to um, assert that that one uh, to uh, maybe 3% of testosterone that's free is the only active testosterone. Um, however, if you look at the uh, megalin um, and a non-genomic uh, uh, signaling, it's, um, we can take it a different pathway. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I don't think that there should be a focus on SHBG except in extreme uh, circumstances. Now, Keith, what are some extreme circumstances where SHBG is 
uh, detrimental and elevated? Uh, well, uh, low SHBG has been a uh, associated, you know, independent uh, predictor of uh, the metabolic syndrome, type two diabetes. Uh, you know, it's uh, so uh, I'd rather have a high sex hormone monitor while we live in a low any day. I, I personally don't don't need to measure it since I follow my free testosterone levels and. So, uh, so, you know, I, I do know that if you want to raise your sex hormone binding globulin, all you need to do is become insulin resistant and it'll go right up. I mean, it'll go right on down for you if you want to lower it. If you want to lower sex hormone binding globulin, drink, eat bad, gain a lot of weight, become insulin resistance, and your SHBG will go down. I think, you know, and I've got other studies that I'm looking at right now here about that. And that's, a, a, once again, a whole other topic. But I do believe that people have the, uh, the, uh, the misconception that sex hormone binding globulins only function is to bind up hormones. Uh, they're finding out that it has much more important functions in the human body and, it's, and it, that are necessary and beneficial to us. So, uh, you know, I can send you one that I'm looking at right now. And, uh, and so, uh, once again, your readers can, can read in detail the importance of sex hormone binding globulin. You know, they just, they just think that it's something that binds up testosterone. So if I can I can lower it. I'm going to get more testosterone. No. And I'm going to feel better. It just doesn't, that, that, that doesn't work that way. It no, sounds very simple, but you're oversimplifying a complex, you know, physiologic system, which is our body. And sex from our body globulin plays much more of a role in our bodies than just binding hormones. Yeah. Okay. I think that's very clear. I'm going to forward this to you as well. So we can have, have this at the, it's coming to you now. Okay. I'll post that in the Facebook group. So I mean, I think the most important thing that we can do too, and we always talk is, is to at least provide information, provide studies uh, so that we can read and, 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 and interact with, with some of these studies. And so that, you know, what happened I, I, a couple of weeks ago doesn't happen again. <laughs> hey, I think uh, what would be a good idea is if we uh, pick one or two topics and then identify one or two key studies and walk completely through the studies. Uh, because I, I think that would uh, show a lot and like um, I familiarize everyone with the process of interpreting the research and what the conclusions were and what conclusions can be drawn from what was published. So, yeah. Okay, that's a very good idea. Getting back to the question from Deep Freeze with the estrogen symptoms. So he has low libido, fatigue, erectile dysfunction. He has been on and off TRT for three years. And um, the question again was, does he lower his dose of testosterone or does he add an AI? Well, I think the, uh, I'm just going to say this and let Keith take over. I think that um, the misconception that there are estrogen symptoms versus some other type of symptom, um, it needs to be sort of eradicated. Because um, a lot of people talk about bloat, gaining, uh, like they become bloated, they, they uh, are retaining water, this or that, and they automatically say, well, this is an estrogen symptom. Well, in reality, it's not an estrogen symptom. I mean, you're, you're talking about hormones in the kidneys that are controlling water, and uh, things like that. So I think I, I, I like to shy away from saying that one thing is a symptom and grouping it under uh, the heading of estrogen. What do you think, Keith? Yeah, uh, well, if, yeah, I like to know what estrogen symptoms mean too, since I don't really see a lot of those. 20% uh, uh, or more men will get some water retention when, on, when they first start testosterone. That's usually self-limited, it will go away with time, but, but that's due to testosterone itself. It increases sodium absorption in the distal renal tubules, just alluded to. When I hear a question like that, I have to get back to, once again, let's get back to the basics and see what kind of foundation this man had built initially. Uh, what were his levels? What did his levels get to? What were his symptoms? What were his expectations? Uh, you know, a lot of times it's the fact that their levels never were high enough to overcome the symptoms that they were having. I mean, you know, Different levels for different men will affect different symptoms. So a lot of times it's 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 under treatment. 
Uh, sometimes there are other factors that are contributing to the ED in and of itself. But that was his big concern. We've talked about DHEA improves erectile dysfunction. We've talked about thyroid improves erectile dysfunction. So once again, build that strong foundation and then give it time to work. I also heard, I think, the word, I've been on it on and off. I think uh, one of the biggest problems we run into is that men expect it to work in weeks when it takes months to truly make a significant effect. It's got to be able to give it months. You got to get levels that are in an, in an optimal range, and then you have to give it time to work, and that is months, not weeks. Uh, the number one reason that men and women around the country stop their hormones is that they didn't get the results they expected in the time frame they wanted or vice versa they didn't get the results they wanted in the time frame they expected and the time frame is always weeks not months nobody wants to put the work in the months into it but if they do it works in everybody mm -hmm. i agree so maybe one last question from the q a that i found interesting has a list been compiled of doctors of a similar mindset like you guys in different geographic areas Calling and checking out and eliminating different local clinics because of various practices is uh, exhausting. Is there such uh, list, Keith, of is doctors? There a list? Say that again. A list, of a, a list of doctors with the same mindset like you guys, because it's very exhausting for the man that asks this question to check uh, all the clinics out, how they work, and they don't give uh, cookie-cutter approaches and so on. Uh, a list of good uh, hormone optimization doctors, actually. Well, um, in, from my perspective, I would, think, I would any respectable yeah. clinic, any any respectable clinic, in my opinion, should get anyone a free consultation and tell you how their clinic works and what they do and how they do it. Uh, now they can't. They, that doesn't mean they have to tell you this is what I'm going. I'm not gonna. You know, you, you're not gonna tell them I'm gonna give you X, Y, and Z at these dosages, but you can tell them this is this is what we measure. This is what we do. This is this is our approach to hormone optimization, and uh, that should not that should be a, a free adv a medical advice to someone. What do you think, Scott? Well, I think that um, it's hard to find a, a good physician in this area, uh, but the patient has to have due diligence on their part and go through. And uh, like Keith said, uh, a free consultation is not out of the ballpark. I mean, that's that's that is reasonable. So it's up to the patient to uh, look and, and go through it. As far as a fully uh, uh, comprehensive list, you know, it would <laughs> it would be a full time job just to compile all that stuff. But um, uh, there's characteristics of good TRT practitioners. They can explain why they're doing something, not just uh, say, "Well, this is how I do it. This is how we're going to do it." And if you ask a question about why. You don't get an answer. Um, that's one of the things I like about Keith is, uh, you know, he explains things. And I think that's very valuable uh, to patients. So um, but that's that's my perspective. Um, I was trying to think of anything else that uh, I could add to that. And I really, you know, as far as. Yeah, I mean, red flags for me are, you know, looking for any hidden fees. I mean, uh, you know, they, there should be no hidden fees. I mean, a lot of uh, clinics that, that you mentioned that, said is they, they uh, you know they, they may charge let's just say a thousand dollars for labs but yet they have a contract with a lab company that costs five hundred dollars so they're making money off of drawing labs on you so they're happy to draw lots of labs for you uh, because they make money off of those labs uh, or if they're trying to run off the bat sell you a lot of supplements and things I try not to do any of that now there's nothing wrong with people doing that but look it is hard enough hard enough to get men and women to, to get on their hormones and do them correctly and consistently and for enough time so that we can get a good, once again, foundation built. Uh, and so I just really don't try to start uh, selling people on, uh, on, 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 on all these other products, uh, first and foremost. I wanna get there. I know that hormones are life-saving. It is preventive medicine. We, we can deal with all the other things later. I think another red flag is uh, if you see a, a site or a physician has a ton of different protocols and with a bunch of things combined, um, you know, 
to me, that's that's always been a red flag. Uh, Yeah, I agree. I was thinking about the MANUP protocol, actually. <laughs> Let's shut yeah. up about that. But that's selling you something along with a lot of other products. A lot of other products besides that. There's a lot of salesmanship there. And that's, once again, but I, I would recommend that, I, uh, look, let's face it, Eric Serrano, Rob Common Eric, uh, myself, uh, you know, I can name off others. We're all... Rousier trained physicians. So I would go in first place. I would start and look is look at world link certified BHRT specialists, people that have actually gone through all the, all the, uh, the courses with Rousier and actually taken the time to take the test, to pass the test to become certified through world link, uh, through Dr. Rousier. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's very clear. So um, I think we should end uh, the Q&A for now. So before we end the episode, uh, we, let's do the bro science section that uh, Dr. Keith Nichols uh, introduced uh, the first time we did this. So I will ask you the best or maybe the worst piece of bro science you heard or read online and uh, how you want to debunk that piece of information. So I already found a good one uh, a while ago. So what about vasectomy and uh, low T? Is there any relation between those two? Because that's uh, talked about a lot online. Keith? Not that I'm aware. No. no. So I've tried to stop. <laughs> I've tried to refrain myself from going to some of these websites because it gets my blood pressure up too much when I go to <laughs> look at some of the things being said on some of the uh, bro science websites. So I've tried to refrain myself, especially I guess the last bro science that I heard that caused the most trouble was that uh, applying testosterone transcrotally, your DHT is going to get to be ten thousand. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was, that, that's the last that's that's the the the, the 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 worst one i've heard recently okay i heard heard that as well <laughs> and you scott <laughs> you uh read anything uh, special uh well i uh, heard a, a podcast about um uh, muscular hyperplasia recently and um that's a complete topic for another video but um, high, uh, skeletal muscle hyperplasia in humans um, has not been proven. Fibers are post mitotic, um, they hypertrophy, but there is no hyperplasia except in extreme experimental conditions. So that's the only one that I've heard recently that um, is um, something I could talk about. Okay. Thank you so much. So we're almost uh, one hour in, so we will end this uh, episode. But before we um, say goodbye, Scott, how can you be reached if uh, people want to ask you anything? Uh, where do you work? And what are you working on for the moment, actually? That's interesting. Well, um, what am I not working on right now? Uh, I'm, people can contact me at uh, uh, Howell at tier1hw.com. Um, at the moment, uh, Keith and I are um, developing um, the research division of his practice, and we're going to get that up and going uh, so that we can start to uh, uh, do some studies in the area of uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, I, I also work as a, a faculty member for a university and, and, and teach PhD courses. So uh, if anybody wants to contact me, um, they, they can use that uh, email that I mentioned. And, um, uh, you know, I'm working closely with Keith to try to get something up soon so that we can uh, start to release some peer reviewed material in the literature and um, uh, start to make an impact in this area. Because it's a very, very important area. It's something that affects every patient, uh, every patient is exposed. And the types of exposure are so elaborate and so multi-tiered that it is uh, proven almost uh, an insurmountable uh, task to try to tease these relationships apart. But that's the intent that uh, Keith and I have moving forward. Right. We look forward to adding Scott uh, 
Uh, of course, he'll be the uh, head of the research department, and uh, I look to make him the uh, the practice director in general. So I look forward to bringing Scott on board and all his expertise that he can add. And certainly, he's certainly he's going to be able to add a lot to to to, to the practice uh, as far as his expertise and uh, helping men with you know uh, you know everything from diet, exercise, you know physiology. I mean, Scott's going to be a It'll be a godsend. So we look forward to, to getting him down to Chattanooga in the, the very, very near future and uh, having a long lasting relationship. And once again, a, uh, a research uh, department. And I'm truly doing research to, to better men's lives so that we can, you know, uh, show that what we're doing uh, is, that, is, is improving men's, men's health. And what, one of the things that we want to do by, uh, with this podcast is reach out when we start to recruit for. For trials, um, so we can send uh, increase the um, the uh, pool of those that might be um, eligible for the trials that we want to conduct. So that's going to be a big thing for us. I'm sure everyone will be so uh, grateful for all the help you provide and the uh, research you're doing. So w once you want to reach out using the YouTube or Facebook uh, group, just go ahead and. Uh, to try to get patients to work with you. And you, Keith, how, uh, because I see in the chat box several people uh, asking how they can work with you. How can you be reached uh, most easily? Uh, and where uh, are you? Uh... Sure. It's t Tier 1 Health and Wellness in Chattanooga. You can Google Tier 1 Health and Wellness in Chattanooga. Okay, and that thank web, you. That's our web, that's our web, it'll be, uh, it's, uh, you know, so uh, I'm at, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm K Nichols at, tier1hw.com just like Scott's S. Howell at tier1hw.com so those are those are websites mm -hmm. okay a lot of people have been watching the, this live stream and still are so I want uh, uh, to mention once again if you're interested in um, these topics you will be interested in our uh, closed Facebook group that is called TRT and Hormone Optimization Therapy HOT so please join these great guys are in there together with uh, many more experts. And I want to thank Danny Bossa again for all the help he provided in the chat box because next to our chats here, he has been answering a lot of stuff and reposting uh, and moderating the chat box. So thank you so much for that, Danny. Yeah. Okay, uh, Danny. Keith, Scott, see you next time. Thank it's you for awesome. uh, being on. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Okay. Yes, thank you. And I'll... Uh, I'll end uh, the episode right here.